Hello my friends! I'm glad to see you made it! We're gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God, He's alive! I want to remind you guys that we're working here on the book of Ephesians. And we'll be going through that again. We'll be going through chapter 3 and 4 today. And uh, I hope to, that, that through the end of this study of the book of Ephesians that you know, you, we will all have a greater relationship with, with God our Father. So, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today to, to ask for your kingdom to come. To, to give us the ability, the strength, the knowledge, and the wisdom to, to sanctify your kingdom here on earth. Just as it is sanctified there in heaven. Gracious God, give us the power and the strength to, to be the children you have called us to be. Forgive us, Father, for, for our wrongdoings and the times we have failed. Give us the strength and, and the power to forgive others. To forgive. Father, protect us from, from the, our, our heart's desires which leads us down the paths of testing and, and trials. Oh, Father, it is your kingdom, it is your power, it's your glory. We are all seeking. Come, reign today, your Holy Spirit, upon this video and the, anyone who's watching, their homes, their families, their friends. Bless them, Father. Bless us all. Have mercy on us in the whole world. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Yahshua, the Messiah, we all pray. Amen. So today, my friends, I want to talk to you all about the book of, of Ephesians. And I want to start here, though, as I like to go a little bit of the Old Testament and then the New. But I want to start at, at Psalm 106 today, and it's kind of a little bit of a long psalm, but uh, it, it's just a reminder, a reminder, you know, as we look out into the world, and today a lot of people are very afraid of the wrath of God, very afraid of the coming of our Lord. So, I want to remind you that who our God is, who our Father truly is. And, and He is all love, all loving. And, and He's all love for His children. And He always has been. He, even though the children of God have many times turned from Him, forsaken Him, forgotten Him, He has never forgotten His children, never left no no child behind. So, Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord? Who declares all His praise? Blessed are they who observe justice who do righteousness at all times. Remember, O oh Lord, when you show your favor to your people, help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of, of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled the sea at the Red Sea, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he lived for them, yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known 
his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. And he led them through the deep as though a desert, through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foes and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries. Wow. Remember now that the, the kingdom of God is no longer a physical type kingdom, you know, like America or England or Israel. It's a spiritual kingdom, and that kingdom is inside of us, in our hearts. Right? And so he covers the adversaries with the water. Isn't that right? Through, through, through baptism, that's repentance of sins. That's the washing away of our sins, being born again. Right? And that's the thing. It's even like in the days of Noah. God comes and has the great flood. Saves the eight. But, but covered over the adversaries with the water. Same with our sins. Our wickedness. Our wrongdoings. It's covered over. But by even a, a greater covering than the water. It's covered over by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. By the blood of, of Yasu. And that covers over our, our sins. So, so when God sees us, he sees Jesus. He sees the blood of Christ. And it covers over our, our adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his word. They sang his praise, right? Not one of the adversaries is left. All sins, every one, you have been redeemed from. Past, present, and future. But they soon forgot his words. They did not wait for his counsel. But they had a wanting craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. When they camped, when the men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abraham. Fire also broke out in their company and a flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in horror and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for an image of an ox that eats grass. And that's the thing, you know, we got to be very careful today. Is we don't want to exchange the glory of the living God for an idol. You see many people bow down and pray to statues, statues of Mary. People pray and bow down to crucifixes, statues of Jesus hanging on a cross. See, people, you use, uh, like, things... Made by man's hands called like, you know, rosaries and, and things of that nature to, to, to have the glory of God be, be seen there. Glory of God is so great, so enormous. Not even the heavens can hold the glory of God, not the earth. Not even man itself can contain the glory of, of God. And you say, why are you always bothering with the Catholics. And I'll tell you, you know, I just went to a, a baptism thing and watched this wonderful stuff and a lot of people being baptized and they get to give their testimony and, and most of them were Catholics. And they lived most their life feeling that they were not forgiven, that they were not worthy of the love of God. Because they had no personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
It was just a religion. It wasn't a relationship. It's just a religion. And when they beat you down, you know, a lot of times they make you think that, that right away you got to be baptized as a child. And, and don't, you know, you got to make that as a, an adult decision with a sound mind with full knowledge of what it is you're doing. That baptism of the water comes through a full immersion of the water. Both physically through, through water and the living water, the water of the Word of God, a full immersion through that Word of God. Because it's through the, the entire Word going through it all, you come to this great understanding of who He is. He's alive. He's, he's alive, and He's here on earth, and He lives with us today. And, and so, that's the thing, is we don't want to be beating down our, our brothers and our sisters. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them. But had not Moses his chosen one stood and preached before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Right? And how much greater is Jesus Christ than, than Moses? For it is Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, the saving Christ of God, that, that was in Moses, that moved Moses to, to hold back God's wrath. They despised the pleasant land, having no faith in His promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. And remember, our tents is our body. We murmur in our tents. You know, sometimes when we cry out to God, it's when we're, we're at our weakest point, when we're at our most faithless place in earth, in life. And that's why we're crying out to God. Is we've lost faith, we've lost hope. And we need Him to return and restore that hope, restore that faith. Because that's, our, that's, that's what gets us through each and every day. It's the hope and the faith of Jesus Christ. Our hope and faith in Him. Therefore, He raised His hand and swore to them that He would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring, offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. And he did that, right? He sent them out in Jesus' time there, about 70 some years after, you know, Jesus there, they, they destroy uh, Jerusalem, destroy Israel. And today, it is returned. It has been restored. 1948. You know, it's like we're in the last 70 years. And so, the good Lord is about to return. And a whole new age, a whole new life. Well, whatever you know here on earth or ever thought of is going to be completely different. How, we don't know, but, but it will be different. And that's the thing. You got to remember, you know, as we go through the book of Ephesians, as Paul begins to talk there in chapter 3 about some of the pains and the sufferings he was enduring. He was in prison while writing the letter and encouraging those in, in, in the Ephesians, you know, people that he had talked to in churches and places that he had went and, and introduced the gospel of Jesus and they started to respond to it. And he wanted to give them encouragement. They don't let my pains and sufferings that I am enduring discourage you or hold you back from believing in God. And it's said today, you know, we see 
Christians being murdered and stuff all about. And don't let those things discourage you. Just know that the Lord our God is. He is here. And He knows what's happening. He's the one delivering them into eternal life. And that's the thing. Paul and them had a vision of a future. He had God's plan. He knew God's plan. Think about 2,000 years ago and today. Especially you here in America. You live in a land of utopia. Compared to the land that they had there in their time. Right? I mean, look what the, the what was the result of the pain and suffering that, that all the disciples and apostles and men and women throughout time through, through their pain and suffering. Well, what, what's the result of it? A place of great love. A whole nation of, of, of you know, of refrigeration. Look what happened to the prayers and the things. He says how, you know, now that we have the Christ, all things will be possible to us. We have airplanes. Where do you think the airplane came from? Someone prayed to God. Maybe they didn't see the, the result of their prayer, but, but the grandchildren did. The future did. Right? They, they never thought Israel could be a great place. Look there today. The whole world wants to own Israel. Because that's the glory of God and the promise that God made to His children. And we can see physically here on earth prayers of magnitude beyond imagination. You're talking a man 2,000 years ago. Beyond our imagination. Do you think they ever thought we'd be flying, driving in cars, have heat, have air conditioning, warm water running, toilets? I mean, think about it. Uh, the love God has. Uh, uh, the world they were creating, a world that, that they were coming from, a world of violence and murder. And the fittest and the strongest only survive. But the meek and those who love will inherit the earth. And look how God has answered prayer after prayer, creating a world and a place like never be seen before. Never known to humanity before. All these things came in the last 100 years. <coughs> he said, right? And he'd make them fall in the wilderness. Ain't that like our lives? You know, many of us, we find Jesus, we find God, we find the will to want God while we're out in the wilderness. When we're not in church, we're out in life, and the wilderness failing, being broke down. And then we begin to grow a will, a desire to be saved, to be delivered, to be helped, to be comforted, to be wanted. To have a purpose. And God moves that will and then brings you into the relationship. Will bring you into the church. Bring you into to his love and to his community. Then they yoked themselves to Baal of Beor. They ate sacrifice offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out among them. <clears throat> then Philonius stood up and intervened, and the plague was stayed. And that was counted to him as righteousness from generation to generation forevermore. They angered at him at the waters of Maribel, 
and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. They did not he they did not destroy the people as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. Right? And we got to be careful. Sometimes we have toxic friends. Friends, they're not godly friends. They have no desire to be godly friends, but, but they're good people. They're friends. They're loving people. They're nice. Right? But, but pretty soon we, we begin to, to, they have an influence on our lives. We begin to listen to do what they say. Ah, oh, that guy's really cool. I'm going to be like him, you know, and... and so then we begin to go down that path. They, maybe you, you like a, a beer once in a while, but they love whiskey and they like a lot of beer. And pretty soon, hanging out with them, one beer isn't enough. Now I need a, some whiskey and I need more. You know, before, you know, maybe, you know, we're into listening to bad jokes, racist jokes, things of that nature. And then all of a sudden, here's your friend, he can't get off the racist jokes, the bad jokes. But you like him and you listen to him. And then all of a sudden, there you are, telling the bad jokes. And that's the thing. You know, we've got to be very careful of what we're doing. You know, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Yes. Is Scientology another way? No. Is there any other way? No. No. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood, right? America is one of the leading nations in the world in abortions, giving up their children, murdering their sons and their daughters for, for, so they don't have to, to taint this golden image that they are trying to create for themselves. Their personal desires are more important than a child of, of God. Or maybe they just don't understand in their mind how holy their child truly is, how loved their child is. Maybe they're dark and they're blinded and they just don't know that there's a Savior waiting to deliver them. God says our children die from lack of knowledge. How will they believe unless they hear the word of God? And who are they going to hear the word of God from unless we tell them who the word of God is? What is Jesus Christ? Who is he about? What has he done to me? And if he did it to me, if he done it for you, won't he do it for them? Yes. We need to have faith in that. We have to have faith in that. Thus they became unclean by their acts and played the whore in their deeds. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he adored his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they brought and they were brought into subject under their power. Right? And if your sins are oppressing over you, you know the guilt and the shame, because that's what happens when we sin get full of guilt and shame begins to press over us. Now we feel un unworthy to go spread the gospel. We feel unworthy to, to be a child of God. We don't even try. 
you know, sometimes we see the world as being so much farther, having so much more worth than, than eternal life. You know, that, that God has no value. Yeah, it's a free gift to all men. But, but God says the value of you is so great. He, he cost everything. He paid out everything. He sold out his glory of being God to become a man for, for you. And that's the thing. We've got to recognize. He didn't just do it for you, but he did it for all the world. For everyone. And that's the thing with God, knowing the truth of God, to the love of God. You know, and when we're afraid and we're all worried about the wrath, it's because we're living in sin. We're separated from God. Sin causes the separation. You know, we're, we're to be the holy children. We're holy beings. God is a holy being. And it comes through the washing of the water. The washing of the blood. We, we got to know who he is. We got to seek him out. Through the word. The word is the water. Right? We don't want God to rule over us. God gives us bad rulers. You know, when, when, when nobody's believing in God. And, and we're worshiping whatever we want. And, and then they become rulers over us. And begin to oppress over us. And, and we begin to cry out. We become subject to the powers of this world. Many times he delivered them. But they were rebellious in their purpose. And were brought low through their iniquity. Nevertheless. He looked upon their distress. See, that's the thing. All the rebellion, the iniquities, the wickedness, it brings distress. It brings depression. It brings tears, sorrow, pain. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who had held them captive. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. And He has returned them to, to Israel today. And remember, you know, all the children of God are his, his, the apple of His eye. So there, Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going over Paul, and he's kind of begins to talk about, you know, the, the authority he had been given to preach the gospel. And Jesus Christ gives all of us the same authority. We don't need the authority of some man or some person or some piece of paper. You know, he said, go and make nation, uh, disciples of all nations, of everyone, everywhere. And know that, that he will be with you every day to the very end. So, chapter 3. I am sure you have heard of the ministry which God in his goodness gave me in your regard. That is why to me, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, God's secret plan... I have briefly described it was revealed. When, when you read what I have said, you will realize that I know what I am talking about in speaking of the mystery of Christ, 
unknown to men in former ages, but now revealed by the Spirit to the holy apostles and prophets. It is no less than this. In Christ Jesus, the Gentiles are now co-heirs with the Jews, members of the same body, and sharers of the promises through the preaching of the gospel. Through the gift of God in His goodness bestowed on me by the exercise of His power, I became a minister of the gospel. And the word minister is also servant. I became a servant of the gospel. To me, the least of all believers was given the grace to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all men on the mysteries designed for which ages was hidden in God, the creator of all. Now therefore, through the church, God's manifold wisdom is made known to the principalities and the powers of heaven. In accord with this old promise, with his age-old purpose, carrying out in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ and through faith in Him, we can speak freely to God, drawing near Him with confidence. Hence, I beg you to not be disheartened by the trials I endure for you. They are your glory. Right? And that's the thing, is what we see through, through the pains and the sufferings is faith. An undying faith in the truth, in a reality. Right? Nobody would die for it. Maybe nobody would endure the pain for a lie. Or maybe, or I don't know. But, but for the truth, the absolute truth. Something you had seen, heard felt, touch, you would die for that. And you'd endure all those punishments. You know, and that's the thing what Paul is explaining. Look at the grace of God. I used to beat these people down. I'd drag them out of their home and destroy them. And look at the good grace God poured onto him. Right? He, he, he thought he was very religious, very holy person, self-righteous. He stood there while Stephen was stoned to death. Did nothing. But, but God, through His grace and mercy, instead of allowing Paul to continue to walk down a path to hell, saved him. From that, he revealed himself to a hater, murderer, slanderer, a fault finder, blasphemer. God had mercy on that man. Because it's when our eyes are opened and our hearts are opened to receive God, when we believe in him. We are completely transformed from a hater, a murderer, into a lover and a saving being. We want to save you from the destruction. And that destruction comes through, through ourselves, destroying our own self. It doesn't even matter about the other people or what they're doing in life. All we can do is save myself. And how do I, can I save myself? But by asking God for forgiveness. Because as, as we go through chapter 3, chapter 4 here, this is this thing. We have to bear with one another. For we are all sinners. And what's that mean? What's all this come to? What's it mean? There's only one remedy for sin. One thing for sin. There's only one escape, one remedy for man. Forgive.
Jesus Christ is forgiveness. And, and that's the remedy to all of it. Is forgive. And if we can believe Jesus Christ can forgive us for the magnitude of our dirt and our sin, can we not forgive our brothers and our sisters for their sin? Because that's the remedy to sin. There ain't no magic pill. There ain't no magic thing. There ain't no magic verse in the Bible. The remedy to sin is this. Forgiveness. We mustn't overlook it. We must cover that in the water. We must cover it in the blood. Right? Because that's what this comes down to. That's the only remedy to the answer of man's destruction. It's forgiveness from God. So, chapter 3, verse 14. That is why I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. And I pray that he will bestow on you gifts in keeping with the riches of his glory. May he strengthen you inwardly through the working of his spirit. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. And may charity be the root and foundation of your life. Thus, you will be able to grasp fully with all the holy ones and breath and bread at the length and the height and the depth of Christ's love and experience this love which surpasses all knowledge that you may obtain to the fullness of God himself to him whose power now at work in us can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations throughout the end. Of Amen. So, to finish this up, and I know in chapter 4, we'll get to chapter 4, we'll go through that, but right here, it's going to uh, open up your mind as we go through chapter 4. So, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little children. Oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, chapter 18. So it's called the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 22. Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And Peter asked him, how many times do I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Seven times? And he says, no, 77 times. Seven times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one brought to him, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, a great deal of money. And since he could not pay his master, he couldn't pay him. Right? And since that, his master ordered him to be sold, his wife and children on all that he had, and the payment that may be made, so that the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, 
and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Have, have pity on me. Forgive me, Father, and, and give me time. Have patience on me, and I will repay you the debt. God, Jesus Christ, says to each and every one of us, your debt is free. Not only do you have to pay it back, no. It's done. It's gone. Let it go. He wants to settle the account. And the account, whatever it is you think you owe, no matter how great it is, it's gone. I don't need patience. I, I already see your good heart, your good will, and your love. It's gone. You're clean. White. Like snow. But, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, right? But we have a lifetime of sin, lifetime of wickedness, a lifetime of greed, a, a lifetime of wrongdoings that God has let go forevermore. That sometimes one person can do one bad thing to us. One wrong thing. Call us one bad name. Hurt me one time. Betray me one time. Reject me once. You know we do it to God over and over throughout all our lives. But when somebody does it to us one time in life. Boy. What happens to us? And so we got to control that that heart. We need the heart of God. We need a heart of charity. I mean, that's the thing. You don't want to be the servant beating people down, telling everybody, come to church and confess your sins each and every day. Each and every Sunday, confess, confess, come on. You're, you're so unworthy, you're so dirty. And then once you confess, you know, they and they because you're confessing out in front of everybody, right? And that's not what he's talking about. You personally and the man that you are having a conflict with, you too, secretly. Take care of that problem. You know what that's the thing. You want to turn everybody into liars? Make everybody feel guilty and ashamed of who they are? God made you to be exactly who you are today. He formed you and made you. Those two stars in the sky and in the universe are the same. They all have a different twinkle. They all are a little bit different. And so are the men and the women on this earth. We have our own twinkle, we have our own shine. We're all a little bit different. Right? And we need to have a, a heart of forgiveness because that's the, the, the remedy, the answer to all sin. There's nothing we can do about it. So God gave us a remedy. God gave us the answer. God gave us forgiveness. And that forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ. Comes through Himself. God is our Savior. God is our everything. And if God can forgive us for, for our bad day, can we forgive others for their bad day? For, for their wrongdoings, their mistakes? You know, even though they're not they're living exactly the way they are supposed to be living, living blind, living in death, should we not have pity on them? Should we not have compassion for them? Because there's no man on this earth that's escaping the earth, escaping death, escaping from the wrath of God. 
unless you're covered in the water, unless you're covered in the blood of the Lamb. Do we believe it? That's faith. Crying out in hopeless situa situations when, when it's dark. Who are we going to cry to? Where are we going to go? The only thing we have is hope in one thing, that Jesus Christ will hear my cry, hear my prayer. And He does each and every day. We've got to believe He's here with us. Sometimes we can't see the answer of our prayer immediately. But it doesn't mean God's not going to answer that prayer. So, he had only a hundred denarii. So he, he seized him, began to choke him, and say, pay me what you owe. How many times have we ever loaned out money to people? If we're going to give someone money, we're going to loan someone money to help them out. A brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a son, a daughter, whoever it may be in life, a friend. We also have to have it in our heart to release them from what they owe us. Yeah, we'd like them to repay us. Yeah, I loaned you a thousand dollars, you know, when you're down and out, but are you going to hold that against them? Hold your friendship uh, uh, that money that you lent them in their need? You gave it to them because they needed it. Going to hold that uh, against them? You have to be prepared to let them go of that bondage. You can't hold that against them. We're going to walk as God will. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him into prison until he could pay the debt. When the fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported everything to their master and all that had taken place. Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you of all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay back all his debt. So also my Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, will do the same to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So it's all pretty much wrapped up right there, right? It's forgiveness. You know, we can talk about God and Jesus and go to church all we want. But, but if we're rejecting children of God and not having a heart of charity, a heart of love, we, we got to ask ourselves, why not? Because the Spirit of God is those things. So why not? Well, what's happening? What's holding me back? What's keeping me from, from fulfilling the purpose God made me to be? It is the vessel. It is a vessel to glorify the name of God. That's what He's made us to be. A living vessel here on earth to glorify the name of Jesus Christ so He may glorify our Father. The Spirit of all things. And that's the thing. What, what, what greater way to glorify God than to have children for God. Right? So we want to be like our Father. We want to grow one day to be like Jesus. We don't want to grow up to be like Peyton Manning, the best quarterback in town. You know, if you, if you try, if you work hard, at your heart's desire in the same way. 
Peyton Manning goes as he wants to be like his dad. Begins to, to go through all the offense, all the defense, all the offense, all the defense, the game plan, the planning, practicing, practicing. And one day, sure enough, not only are you just like your dad, but he's the greatest quarterback ever. If we had the same desire to be like Jesus Christ, to be like our Father in heaven, He came to give us the statue, the, the model, to the, the way. He's the way, the life, and, and the truth. This is the way of life, to, to follow Him in His footsteps. Wanting to, to be like our dad, and if we practice, found out the offenses and the defenses of all the things God has to offer us through the gifts of His love. We'd be like our God, like our dad. Just like Him. Right? Disciples, Peter and all the disciples, James and Andrew, they didn't become guys like seminary guys. They didn't become, go to seminary school. They didn't become great theology guys. What'd they do? They, they got involved in the world. They got involved with their neighbors. They went out and touched them, hugged them, kissed on them. They didn't have a dime, silver or gold I do not have. But I have the faith in Jesus Christ. Now stand up and walk. Is that not what he came? I came to give you God. I came to give you the Spirit of God. Faith in God. So you have no fear. So you can walk this life with integrity and character. Because it is God our Father that instilled that integrity and character. Instilled the love in you. It just needed to be woken up and released. Remember, that's what God wants us to do. Share our faith in Jesus Christ. See you next time.